Rise and shine, everybody. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. I'm going to give you guys a moment to uh, fill the room all the way up so we can discuss um, the difference between a king and a peasant, okay? So you, many of you guys already are familiar with the Rising to Royalty uh, series, uh, the journey to kingdomship, manifesting your best self, your greatest self. Uh, welcome in, family. Um, I did. I made a mistake yesterday when I advertised this live. I said it would be today, but I accidentally typed in PM instead of AM, okay? So I am going to go ahead and do it this rise, but I'm going to make it public for all of you guys. So lucky day. If you have not already subscribed, you still have access to this uh, Rising to Royalty uh, live today. So you're in the right place if you're trying to go to that next level in life. You're trying to figure out what that, that next thing to help catapult you to that next level of best self then you're in the right place, family. All right? So please, y'all, share this video. Uh, help build up as many viewers as possible so we can have this have a great discussion with as many people as possible. Okay, family? So y'all can have as many people to dialogue with. So tag your friends. Um, thank you so much, Eugene. What's up with you, King? Yeah. So tag your friends, family. It's time for us to um, get on this amazing, amazing build. Is anybody ready for their crown this rise? Is anybody ready to rise to royalty, to be your greatest self, family. Peace, Carmel. Peace, Tyron. I see you guys. I see you subscribers are on. You will have people today uh, for my for my subscriber current subscribers. You will have people today trying to subscribe. Uh, I've I've had many express that it's difficult for them to subscribe. So please uh, type in as many directions as you can to help people with subscribing, and I'll pin whatever I can so we can get people signed up today. Okay. Family, this is going to be powerful, okay? Now, I asked you guys last week, um, what was a peasant? What is a peasant, okay? I'm glad to have you here, Eugene. Powerful brother, powerful brother. I was talking to you guys about forming alliances, family, um, allegiances with people who you know are going somewhere. And Eugene is one of those people. He and I formed an alliance last year, and um, it is truly Blossom family. So we are creating so many things outside of ourselves. So he knows first. He knows first step that you can rise to your greatest self by bringing the right people into your life, having the right conversations, the right builds. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Rise to you. So guys, listen. Let's get ready. Let's get let's get in teacher mode. Let's get in learner mode. Okay. Um. We asked, what is a peasant? What do peasants do? So I want you guys, in your best words, to tell me, what is a peasant? And, and what does a peasant do? What's your best example of a peasant? And um, of course, we've been talking about what is a true king? What, what, what character traits do a, does a true king have? Well, what habits, what character traits, uh, what psychosis um, would, a, would a peasant have? So let's get into it, family. What's up, Ray White? Peace to you. Peace to you, Marsha. Good rise, Renee. Jackie says, this is my first time watching. Watching from Fayetteville, North Carolina. What's up, Jackie? I live in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Well, Rayford, but I used to work in Fayetteville. I used to teach boxing uh, to the military out there. And I used to sell cars as well. And some yeah, many years ago. I was in great shape back then. Time flies. Peace to you, Robin. I used to work at a place called Stuart Nissan. Um, down there, if you if you remember where, where that is, they may have moved it or something, but yeah, that's where I was, family. Uh, let's see here, uh, Quinn Quinn a wind Quinn the wind Buckley says low mindset, low vibration causing chaos, no loyalty, jealousy, etc. Okay, the, the family is amazing, Ashella. Thank you, Grand Rising to you, Heaven. Ray White said a peasant is someone with a low moral standing. Okay. Renee says, hi. Hi to you, Renee. Christina says, this is my first time watching all the way from Houston. Welcome in, Christina. Uh, I've, I've did many shows in Houston. Love Houston. I always get a full house every time I go. I like what you guys are saying about peasants so far. Let's keep it coming. Many of us could be a peasant and not know it. And this is why we, we, need, to, um, we need to look at this. We don't know what peasants and stuff is now. We don't call people that anymore. But... We want, we want to talk about the characteristics of a peasant and um, and if if you find yourself to be a peasant, 
it's not necessarily a bad thing if that's who you are and if that's who you're going to choose to be. Thank you so much, Heaven. Uh, peace to you, Eddie. But it, it could be a realization moment for you that I am a peasant. I carry myself like a peasant and therefore I will always be a peasant, a commoner. Okay, I will always be a, a part of the people. Okay, I'll always be um, uh, a buyer and not a merchant. You know what I mean? I'll always be in the controlled. I'll always be the person who just says, you know what, let me just stay out of the, the rich's way, right? The noble's way. Let's, let me stay out of the, um, the king's way. I'm, I'm only a peasant, right? What is a peasant, though? What is a peasant? Let's, let's put this into detail, okay? I got this video here. It talks about how medieval times, uh, how, how medieval peasants spent their free time. And so we're going to talk about how peasants spent their free time. And let's see if we can hear who a peasant might be in today's society, who a peasant might be in today's world, okay? And if you find that you are a peasant, do you have it within you to make the changes, okay? Do you have the mental fortitude to change your, your paradigm? Your paradigm is the part of your brain that holds your habits, that holds the cycles that you create, that holds your view on the world, okay? So if you change your, your view on the world, you can change your paradigm. You have, if you, first your view on the world changes, you have a new vision, but now you have to change your paradigm, which is the, the place in your brain that holds your habits. So you work, when you work on that, you can change the actions that you're putting out, and that way you can change your future because your cycles are coming from the actions that you're currently doing, and that's why you're in the area that you're in and the place that you're in in life, okay? Rise Kimberly, I see you out in Atlanta. I live in Atlanta too, just actually, believe it or not, two years ago. Well, Suwani, right out there near Atlanta. But let's get started, family, okay? Let's do this. Um, how medieval peasants spend their free time? Y'all ready for this, family? Listen closely, okay? Being a peasant in medieval times was challenging. Their lives were Hang on. Around Here we go. Being a peasant in medieval times was challenging. Their lives revolved around agriculture and other tasks assigned by their lord. They owned their strips of land with homes and livestock and worked together to achieve their goals. But it wasn't constant back-breaking labor and unsanitary conditions all the time. Medieval peasants got more off time than most Americans do, working only 150 days per year. They had more free time than you might think. So, today we're exploring how medieval peasants spent their free time. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Channel and let us know in the comments below what medieval topics you would like to hear about. Okay, it is a medieval party, y'all. In the absence of video games and the internet, medieval peasants entertained themselves in creative ways. One of them involved bobbing for apples. It isn't just that game you have to randomly play at a Halloween party. In medieval times, peasants made a fun game out of it by mixing in some romance. This courting ritual worked like this. Each apple was assigned the name of some handsome lad from the village. Peasants threw all the apples into a bucket of water and let the game begin. One of the women would risk drowning herself to snag one of the love apples in her teeth. If she caught the apple on her first attempt, that meant the two were destined to be together. If it took two tries, then the relationship probably wasn't going to work out. They usually wouldn't make a third attempt. And after she snagged the apple, eating it wasn't part of the game. Instead, she'd take the fruit home, place it under her pillow, and enjoy pleasant dreams of her future partner. How long they'd keep the apple there is up for debate, but hopefully they removed it before it got all apple mealy nasty. All right, family, so meditate on that. I'm going to turn this um, meditation music down so I can focus. At the same time, I'm playing this other video. It's bothering me. I don't know if it is y'all, but uh, give me one moment. You guys talk about it, okay? Okay. So I saw someone type in here that peasants are, peasant is a poor, let's see here, uh, peasant, peasants are poor uh, farmer of low social status who owns or rents a small piece of land for cultivation uh, in historical use 
uh, or with reference of the substance substance. Uh, let's see here. Excuse me, guys. Subsistence uh, farming in poor countries. Now, absolutely, family. So this right here is, uh, is uh, of course, the definition from online. But the main main problem with this is when they when they um, these farmers had to pay taxes to the nobles. OK, and to the merchants. So, yeah, they were they they um, follow the agrarian calendar, which means they, they worked in agriculture. So they followed the sun, obviously working up from sun up to sun down, farming land, tilling the ground. But they had to e either give a part of their harvest or the money they earned from selling the food to the people who literally allowed them to live on the land if they tilled this land. OK, and so that's what a peasant typically does for a living is they work on the on, on the on the um, working to work in farming. Those low rating so, so, uh, type of jobs, dirty jobs. Right. But they have to pay the taxes to the noblemen to be able to occupy the very land that they are tilling. Right. But anyway, it's talking about what the nobles did outside of that. What did they do to, to waste their time? Because we all have a job to do. Right. We all have a job to do. That doesn't necessarily make us a peasant, a person who is a farmer. They can be a peasant, but their aspirations can turn them into a merchant. So they're not um, they're not walls put on who you can be socially um, in, in, cert in certain instances with class. OK, but the peasants carry themselves in a certain way. And that's what separated them from the merchants. OK, because you can be a merchant, but you're not. You're, you are a peasant. So what does a peasant do? They talked about uh, peasants would bob for apples. They would create games. OK, and one of those games being bobbing for apples. Now, I want you guys to, with your mind, because I tell you, the ability to think is what makes you a king. Your kingdom is in here. Your ability to be able to see something and um, see, see the, um, the, um, the truth of it, okay? So let's just say you got all these people bobbing for apples uh, when it comes to romance. And who's, who's ever name you come out with, that's who you're going to be with or potentially marry. Can you guys see the problem with that? When, it come, when, when a king is selecting his bride or queen uh, based on assets, based on tribe, community, resources, okay, G uh, genetics. When a king is choosing his, his queen based on those things and a peasant is choosing his queen or her queen uh, based on a game like bobbing for apples, can you see how that would affect your lineage? Okay, so they're, they're leaving it to chance. These peasants are leaving it to chance on how they breed. OK, so they have this this folklore or this um, these, um, you know, uh, what you call it? Uh, it's whatever it's good luck or bad luck, uh, you know, um, superstitions. They have these superstitions surrounding love and marriage. And so they play these games, believing that if you bob into this water and come out with this apple, you know, you're going to get your husband. But you can see how that doesn't lead to having a harmonic relationship where you're focused on genetics, where you, where you are choosing your person based on the vision that you want. OK, so as a peasant, you can't just be, um, you know, just caught up in the the uh, the folklore of the peasants. You know what I'm saying? Choosing your bride like a like a peasant. That's one of your first steps. So as you can see, they spend their time away from work doing things that are not going to help them further their kingdom or create a kingdom. They're acting like a peasant. OK, so we can see that. Right. Spend their time working and dreaming. Um, instead of planning to be one of the nobles. So there you go. Thank you so much, Grace. And that, that's one of the things, though. Ask yourself, do I play games when it comes to my courting? Do I leave my dating up to chance? Do I, do I just, am I just playing craps with how I date? You see what I'm saying? Do I just leave it to chance? Am I just, by, by just walking up to women because, or walking up to men or trying to date based on just my own desires and no, nothing really more than that? You see what I'm saying? Am I dating like a peasant or am I dating like a king? Am I choosing my person with my vision in mind or am I just, you know, accepting my person because that's who's there at the time? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, it'll be a, it'll be a meeting. Thank you so much for subscribing as well. Here's a, here, here, let's continue on. Everyone loves a good game of football or American soccer even medieval peasants. Today's football fans are passionate and occasionally resort to antics during a match. But during the Middle Ages, it was the players who went a little crazy during the game. One might even say they put on a ludicrous display on most nights. The logistics of the game were a mess. There was no field or even a defined number of players. Basically, 
Anyone who showed up could play. Sometimes that could be hundreds of people, or even a whole town. The game's ball was a blown up pig's bladder. The goal was a bit different too. Instead of kicking the ball through a goal, the idea was to be the first team to kick it to the other village's church. It was a rule-free affair, with great potential for violence during a match. Injuries and death were routine, so naturally, the game was popular. English and French kings tried to ban the game, but only because they believed it took peasants away from doing other important things, like practicing archery or going to war. But that didn't stop the peasants and mob football from being popular for the next few centuries until it declined and gave way to the more modern sport we know today. Wow. Okay, so hopefully you, you guys' um, thinking caps is ringing off. Let me read what Devin said first. He said, peasants escape reality and dissect uh, or distract themselves from the reality of being a peasant by, versus focusing on getting out of that identity. Facts. Now look, you see that they blow up a, a, pig, a pig's bladder and so, they said so many people would come out to play this game, right? In droves. They'd come out in droves. And there would be injuries, sometimes even death. Like it was very common. It, it ain't fun if people ain't dying. So they would risk their lives over games, family. Over games. They would come from everywhere to risk their health and lives for a game because it distracted them from their everyday lives. Okay? What does that sound like, family? You understand? Who does that sound like, family? Okay, so they, they're, they're rushing out to, to uh, tackle each other, throw each other down, injure each other, knock each other over to kick a ball around, a, a pig's bladder around. A peace to you, Mary. Thank you for being a subscriber. And it said the kings didn't even like it because the kings would prefer them to be working on something that would better the kingdom. The king, the king knew that that was a waste of time. But here's what happens with these nobles and merchants, family. They see the peasants out there playing the games. And then they put their minds together, talk amongst each other, and regulate that game. Okay? Put a little rules in that game. Uh, um, uh, monopolize the game. Now they own the game. Now they own all the arenas. Now it's illegal for you to play outside of that arena. You understand? And then they're going to pay the peasants to come inside the, the arena and pay for all of the other peasants to watch. You understand? And what happens is... The peasants are who created the game, but they were too busy focusing on the game and not how to merchandise the game, not how to market the game because they think like peasants. They don't think like, let's create something we can own that can create something lucrative. Nothing wrong with the game other than that it hurts people, but football hurts people. There's going to be injuries, family. But we see, we see people, are, people are joining together, getting hurt, and even injuries. There's, there's nothing set up to protect you. And what this, what this uh, merchant comes in, what this noble comes in with a little money, with a little strategy, is they use the very thing that the, that the peasants worked on and for themselves and then employ the, pe the peasants through it and control it. So now you have football teams and they're all owned by, none of them are owned by a peasant. And meanwhile, we're saying, why don't peasants own teams? Because peasants will never own teams. Peasants will forever be a player. And regardless of how much they pay you, you're still a peasant. Even if you're a multi-millionaire playing the game, you're still a peasant in your character. You're still going to spend the money to distract yourself from the games. So you see what I'm saying? So people are going to spend their money to go to the games to distract themselves from their everyday work. The people who are playing the game, it is their everyday work, so they're going to distract themselves with the monies they earn from that game to distract them from their work. You're still going to think like a peasant, and you're not thinking about what can I do to change the world? What can I do to further my kingdom? Peasants don't think like that. They're only thinking about escaping from the rat race. Now, how many peasants do you know? They leave work and the first thing they're trying to do is get to the bar to watch the game. To spend their savings to go to the game, sit front row. You understand? To go play the game even. I've seen people get injured, injured and have to take weeks off of work because they got hurt at, a, 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 at, a, at some type of um, a ball game at, at the rec center. You see what I'm saying? We, we, we look at people who are addicted, addicted to drugs and we see that they'll sell their house and home and, and injure the people around them, uh, hurt the people around them, uh, design relationships around them just so they can get this money. They'll steal from whoever. But this person would do anything to get that drug, won't they? What if we were that way about our futures? What if we were that way about our vision, our kingdoms? Invest wherever you can, even if it means that you don't have it right now. And don't, don't go stealing it from your friends like a crackhead would do. Don't get me wrong. But I'm saying like, uh, yes, it is coping. 
it's coping uh because again it's it's um it's uh it's it's just escaping what you're in so you can get the get the energy or the motivation to do it again so to speak but sometimes life is about focusing family and it, it isn't necessarily about fun it's you know they say you know put in that work so you can play later and sometimes we need to understand strategy we keep trying to separate ourselves from from work uh, but we separate ourselves from work with things that are not going to be conducive for creating that kingdom. So it needs to be something that we're invested in is going to benefit us. You understand? So again, that's the second thing that they named. First, we're bobbing for apples in order to find a mate. A person that we're going to marry with bobbing for apples. You play a game to find a bride. Okay? We, find a, we play a game to find our significant other family. You understand? You ever heard of speed dating? You ever heard of all these things that we do to play games to find a bride? Spin the bottle? These are peasant games, family. Do you understand? And not only that, we're playing games when it comes to finding our spouse. Don't we play games? I mean, we play games. Your men just trying to see how fast they can get it. They're not really thinking about, you know, what type of person. In fact, if she's a good girl, if she has all the qualities you look for to marry, a lot of times a man will step over that and be like, man, I ain't interested in her. I'm interested in somebody who's a little quicker. Who can who gonna give it up a little quicker? I don't want to work hard. I want to, you know, somebody of lower character. We're always looking for that lower vibration because we don't want to work. We don't want to be accountable to being great. We play games to when it comes to finding our mate, and then we're gonna escape work by any means necessary to play another game that could injure us. And that game itself could be the thing that takes us out of the hole if we can uh, create this game with strategy. You understand and create rules in this game and regulate this game properly. But we're not. We're just gonna gather out here a couple times a year. And allow the nobles and the merchants to get ideas from what we're doing, take what we're doing, and sell it back to us and have us working for them just to play it. And, and now they can tell us when we can and can't play it because we play for their teams. They'll take the very thing that we love and monopolize it, man. Right, we're living in the matrix. You're right, guys. And this is why I want to show you all this because, you know, we, we've never, we don't really consider ourselves as peasants. But, hey... By character, by, by, by the way we carry ourselves, we're going to have to accept it for what it is just by hearing how a peasant carry themselves. If we see that in us, it's time to make those changes unless you're okay with being a peasant. Again, there are peasants exist and some people are peasants. Some of you, some of you are peasants. Some of you, that's all you're ever going to be. Your ancestors were peasants, okay? And that's the DNA that you're carrying, and that's okay, okay? You're going to be a commoner. But some of us know that we're meant for greatness. Some of us know that we're being a peasant by being trained to be a peasant, not by, who, by, not by that being internally who we are. So we are miserable being peasants. Some of y'all are okay with that. So don't, don't, I'm not telling everybody that's listening or everybody in the world to stop being a peasant because then we won't have peasants. You understand? Somebody's got to be a peasant, but I'm not a peasant. And I'm here to, to, to rescue the people who know that they're not a peasant and, and show you that you don't have to be. You understand? Thank you so much, Cor uh, Corvette. Let's do this. Let's let's go. Let's let's continue. Archery was kind of a big deal during the Middle Ages. It was so essential that lower class men were required to practice it by law. Some used crossbows, but most relied on their trusty bow and arrow for their training. Becoming a seasoned archer took a ton of practice and time-consuming training in areas known as butts. Men between 15 and 60 years old had to spend significant time practicing each week in training. Kings even tried to ban other activities that took away from the men's valuable training time. Eventually, the standard bow and arrow gave way to the longbow, which required even more training. But it all eventually paid off, at least for the English. At the Battle of Cressy in 1346, longbow archers decimated French forces while suffering minimal casualties. Look at there. The king has all these peasants train, do, do archery training, okay? From ages 10, I believe he said to 60, we're, we're supposed to spend a few hours a day archery training, okay? Now, this was, this was lobbied or, or um, set in place by the king, not the peasants. He found a way to use his peasants. Now, the peasants didn't like this. They would even try to escape this, but it was something that was forced by the king, Okay, that everyone learn how to do archery. Everyone learn how to defend themselves, defend themselves. Everyone, everyone. Okay, from the top to the bottom. And the peasants couldn't see why they had to do this. Why am I just learning how to shoot archery? What does that do for me in my life? You know, I'm not going to be an archer. 
but still learn, the king says, right? Well, why? Because many years later, they would be attacked and they would win this war with minimum ca minimal ca casualties because they all knew how to shoot the longbow. See, kings have vision. A king has vision. He even kings tried to even outlaw other foolish things that the merchants were, that that the uh, peasants were doing, so they could even put more time into archery training. You understand? Because the king knew what he wanted from his kingdom. He he know he says, "Hey, look, any kingdom that has more priests than warriors is a kingdom that's doomed." But you know what? If I don't have enough warriors, what what do I do? You know what? I'm gonna put a bow in all of my in all of my peasants' hands. Does that make life more dangerous for me? Yeah, somebody can shoot me with an arrow when I'm out and about doing my king stuff, riding inside of my box. But I need to make sure that we're all learned. And he chooses to do this anyway, and it benefits the king. You see, so this is why I say all of us as peasants, we must train. We must make ourselves stronger by, by working out, by having a workout regimen. No, you don't know how it's gonna benefit you. And what, that's what most people will say, why am I working out? I'm not, I'm not an athlete. I'm not in some sport, right? I'm not competing. Why do I need to work out? You need to work out because one day you're going to need your body. And, and that working out that you're doing is going to help you be accountable to being the greatest self that you can be. Because when you work out, it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to need the strength that you earn in working out. But when you work out, you sharpen your brain. You increase your blood flow throughout your body. You make your body overall healthy. So if you do need to do something where you need to move, you're going to be better at it, family. Do you understand? Taking the time to put time into your body. You don't know somebody's going to come to attack you a year from now. But if you're working out today, you're going to be better equipped for that person when they come to attack you. You see what I'm saying? Every animal in the world know this. That every day could be your day. So you got to be in shape. You know, the gazelle don't need to chase animals to eat, but they need to run from animals who want to eat them. So you better be in peak condition and be ready to get away from these animals because they're, they're, they're out there looking for you. You understand? And you got to keep in mind that these, these animals... These um, these uh, things exist in life, right? And you got to prepare for them. So you, you can see when a, when a peasant spends their time wisely learning a skill, learning a craft, it benefits the peasant. It benefits everybody around you. So if we as peasants pu pushed ourselves into something to make us all better as a group, we would make the whole economy better. We'd make the whole community better because we working to make ourselves better. As you can see, it starts with us. You understand? Let's continue. Some things throughout history are unique to the human experience. Gambling is undoubtedly one of them. Lotteries go back to ancient Rome. Bible readers will find mention of them in the Old Testament too. But in the Middle Ages, they took on an entirely new meaning. It wasn't exactly scratch tickets and little numbered balls rattling around in a cage. Selling tickets with a chance to win money had its origins during the Middle Ages. Lotteries back then, just like now, were basically a form of taxation. In small towns, lotteries were held to help the poor. In other cases, they could be used to determine spots in a marketplace or selecting public officials. It was costly to enter the lottery in England, but it was attractive for many reasons. Some were indeed in it for the money. Others were probably attracted by the immediate pardon of any past non-violent crimes given to ticket holders. That's a cool perk. Lotteries that resemble the kind we know today began in the 1440s as a means to raise money to reinforce fortifications. Later, Milan used lotteries to help fund their war effort against Venice. England even used them to strengthen the might of the Royal Navy. It's amazing sometimes what a bit of gambling can do. During the 16th century, private lotteries became popular in England. One of them even funded the founding of Jamestown, Virginia. Governments began regulating ticket sales, and lotteries eventually transformed into the extensive industry they are today. Not bad for something that started during medieval times. He said, it's amazing what gambling can do. Now, he's saying people use lotteries to further their wars, right? Sometimes to help the poor. What does that mean? What is explaining to you here is the peasants play the lottery. They look for ways to get out of their situation and they have these high hopes that if they buy this lottery ticket that they'll win and all of their problems will be over. So who funds the lottery? Whenever the, whenever the rich people come up with something that they need to fund, when they come up with something they need to fund, so they, so they come out with a lottery, buy a lottery ticket and if you win, if you buy the lottery ticket, we'll actually forgive you of any 
non-crime related issues. Okay, so there's a reason now to get your money, and they're gonna just alleviate you from uh, from any from anything that we're gonna hold over your head that's non that's non uh, violent crime related, right? Okay, so buy your ticket, and then you can even win money. Okay, and so what they're gonna do is they're gonna use the poor to fund certain things that they want to fund. How? By selling the poor a dream. Only one of them is going to win the lottery, right? It's how the lottery works. Only one or a few of you win the lottery. But because so many of you want to escape your reality, you're going to give them your money. And so they're going to give only a portion of that. You understand? Um, they're only going to give a portion of that uh, to, the, to the winner. You understand? Does that make sense? They're only going to give a portion of that to the winner, and then they're going to use the rest for their cause. You understand? Thank you so much, Asar. Yeah, stay here. Stay right here with us, y'all. Thank you, Corvette. Stay right here with us. We don't want the numbers dropping. In fact, share the content. Share it and like the content, family. Um, some of y'all might have some things to do, but sh make sure you share it before you go, please. This is great, great, great information. It's going to make us better. Now, we've been really going hard on Kevin Samuels. People are happy he's gone. Uh, people uh, expressing their disagreements with him. Well, this is positive information. So if you guys can do that much work to uh, to express how you don't like some information, let's see how much you uh, you do whenever you do like the information. Okay, when you can see that it's helpful. All right. But again, so there's there, there's these lotteries that's created when it comes to funding certain things, and it you know so if it's used to fund the war, then it's used to fund the, the king's initiative to to get power and to conquer, right? Or or to protect depending on what that is. But the lottery is created by the rich to fund something they want to do, not using their own money. So who are they going to get their money from? The poor people, the people who work with the agrarian calendar, the people who work on the land, the small people, by selling them a dream, they're already getting taxes from them just to be able to live on that very land. But now they're going to come back to them trying to sell them a lottery ticket. You understand? It's, it's a trick. They're going to give a portion of the winnings to, to one of the ticket holders. You understand? But that one person, that one peasant that wins that money, they're just going to spend it in their communities and, and squander it. You understand? So it's still not going to further the peasants. It only, it's only going to further the rich's agenda. And so you see many peasants today, we play the lottery. We play the lottery because we're thinking about the um, the how, how it will uh, re 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 relieve us from the matrix that we're in, relieve us from uh, having to work every day, the struggle that we're in. You understand? So we be trying to get them scratch offs and do that, but it's only furthering the goal or the agenda of the lottery, uh, the person who holds the lottery, who's creating the lottery. Do you understand? A lottery can be held for positive reasons, don't get me wrong, but it's never going to help the, um, the commoner unless the money's being raised specifically for them. Do you understand? Now let's go. Now we play the lottery. We know as a peasant, hey, we, we think like this. We're always trying to win something to escape our reality, right? Thank you so much, Angola. Thank you for the comic, uh, for the for the um, for the for the stars. Let's go. Everyone loves a good dice game. This was especially true during the Middle Ages, when dice games were one of the most popular pastimes. That holds true today, considering the popularity of craps and the insane sales Hasbro's Yahtzee sees each year. Fifty million Yahtzees. They can't be wrong. Medieval dice games were pretty standard. Rolling dice carved from bone, people played like highest points. One of the most popular dice games was Hazard. The game's official rules came from King Alfonso X in his 1283 treatise, The Book of Chess, Dice, and Tables. Its origins are murky, but it probably came from soldiers returning to Europe from the Crusades. Players rolled three dice, intending to earn between three and six points or 15 and 18 points. Any other point range resulted in a losing score. Hitting these scores wasn't easy, and the odds were stacked against players. Recent x-rays of some medieval bone dice show they were weighted with tiny bits of mercury. These were likely used at inns or taverns to separate travelers from their money under the guise of a friendly game of dice. See, like they say, a fool will be separated from his money. <laughs> a fool is easily separated from his money, right? So you hear 
the, now, they they talked about the lottery as gambling. Of course, gambling. Okay, you you be you be surprised how far gambling can take you, or what you can do with gambling by using gambling to your advantage by creating a lottery. But it's also expressing that the peasants found gambling all on their own. They would create dice from from the from bones of other animals and gamble away their earnings, and literally fight and kill each other over non payment, over the anger of losing your money. You understand, just like in the streets today, people play dice games and card games and literally come to blows over losing money, cheating during the game, not paying money, ego, whatever the case may be, life, life lost over a damn game. Yo, how many of y'all know somebody who died over a game, died over a game, arguing over a damn game? Like, just think about this, family. Just like today, thank you so much, Christina Nicole. Just like today. And then it showed that some people, the people with money, they would have mercury put inside these bones so they could control the outcome of the game, of the dice roll. Okay, well, how many people do you know today run out to casinos? Run out to casinos to try to get their, to take their chances to win a bunch of casino money. And how many times do we realize these games in these casinos are rigged they're choosing who they're going to pay, give, give money to. Because if it wasn't rigged, they'd end up going broke if it was really, truly by chance. It only take one bad night where a lot of luck is going towards the, the peasants. And they're going to clean your ass out. Right? So they're going to make sure they regulate that. You know, you're not going to, you're never going to win. You're never going to, the house always wins overall. Are there winners at the house? Absolutely. And the peasants are going to see those few winners and say, well, I could win. That means I can win. And they're going to keep playing and spend their money, but they're paying the winner. There's a few winners, but the many peasants is who's paying the winner. The casino ain't losing money. So when the casino has to give out money, oh, that, oh somebody hit over there, they just won 10 grand. Well, guess who just paid them the 10 grand? The other peasants who trying to win money. Thank you so much, Corvette. I'm honored. I'm honored. Truly, truly honored. Yo, this is powerful stuff. And this is why I say like, you know, it's important that we put our mind into these things. When we learn this stuff and we hear this stuff, don't just hear it and move on. You know, I heard someone say that whenever thoughts, whenever we have certain thoughts in our brain, it creates tree-like images in our brains. When you're studying the light that goes through our brain, when you're looking at it through other devices, that when we hear something, that it creates a, a, a small little tree-like light. And uh, the, the neuroscientist that was talking about this says that when you hear basic, when you hear information, when you hear information or see information, the things that you touch, see, smell with your five senses, right? That's your base information. And that is the roots to the tree. So when, when you're learning information or consuming information, when you taste something, touch something, hear something, that's base information and that's the roots to the tree. What you do with that information is the rest of the tree. That's your mind. That's not your brain. That's your mind. So you receive information through your base, uh, through your base, like say five senses, through your body, through your actual physical body. You receive base information through your physical body, through your nervous system. Okay. Um, hear, see, touch, smell. Um, um, hear, see, touch, smell. It's one more. I, I'm, I'm, I'm taste. Yeah, family. So that's that. Those are going to give with your base senses. So let's say I taste something. Okay, I have a taste. Now, I, I know what it tastes like. It's either going to be sweet, uh, salty, it's going to be bitter, right? Uh, savory, whatever. Now, that's the roots. The tree, though, is me saying, oh, this is amazing. You see, oh, I like this. Oh, I'm going to start. I wonder how you make this. It, it, it prompted me to think. It prompted my brain to go somewhere. So when I'm speaking to you guys, a lot of times you hear base information, what you're taking into your, into your body is the base information. What you do with it a lot of times is what you give me credit for. So a lot of times I may say something that triggers you into thought. The thought that you tr that's triggered, that's you. That's your mind. But instead, what happens is you'll, you'll have this thought that you came up with based on something that I said, the base information, and you'll give me credit for your tree, not the root. I may have given you the information to make you think, but... The thought itself that, 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 that followed that the base information was all you. So that's not my brilliant mind. That's your brilliant mind. The thoughts that, that preceded, the, the thoughts that came from the base information that you received. Do you understand? 
So basically, like I can give you the uh, the um, the the things to make the recipe with, but what you do with it is you. So if I give you the the meat, if I give you the the dish, the things that go into the dish, whenever you serve it and you cook it and you prepare it and give it to me and you taste it, if you say, "Dang, Kevin, you're amazing," then you're giving the wrong person credit because you prepared it. I only brought brought it to you. You wouldn't have it if it weren't for me, but you made it better. It's your brilliant mind. Do you, does that make sense, family? So this is why I say we, we must definitely put thought into it. You know what I'm saying? Someone gives you roots, make big trees from it. Make several thoughts from it because those thoughts are what's going to help you grow. It all happens in here, family. Do you understand? So as you can see, peasants loved to gamble because that thrill separated us from the depression, from all that, that we were going through at work, right? We, we, we want to get away from it and have a little excitement, but that, but that excitement is costing you your destiny. That money that you're gambling away, you're not going to have that money to invest in your family. And yes, investments uh, seem to grow a little bit slower than gambling. When you're thinking about gambling, thank you so much, uh, Sandra. Um, uh, they are called uh, dendrites. Thank you so much, uh, Sandra. Somebody said something. You sparked my interest on the better lifestyle, for real, for real. You represent your wives very well. Thank you so much, Corvette. So, family, if you are trying to escape your reality to gamble, please tell me how gambling is going to actually help your lineage when investing can definitely help your lineage. But investments don't grow as fast as uh, gambling winning. So you're going to go gamble before you will investing. And that's what peasants do is invest. Brought my brother Latruth in the building. What's up, bro? Let's continue, family. During the Middle Ages, one couldn't simply head downtown to knock back a few beers and bowling pins whenever they felt like it. Instead, they played an early version of bowling called Skittles, and they played it a lot. In Skittles, you hurl a wooden or rubber ball at nine pins in an attempt to knock them over. Huh, sounds familiar. Whoever knocked over all the pins with the fewest number of throws was declared a winner. The precursor to the Midwest's favorite pastime was big in Great Britain, but had different rules depending on the part of the country in which it was played. In London, for instance, they used a different kind of wooden ball called a cheese. Sometimes people played Skittles with 10 pins, which eventually gave way to the modern version of bowling we know today. Look, family. Bro, we having this great build, man. Say, so what's the word, my guy? We having this great build on a king versus a peasant. And we just learned that peasants invented the game of what we call bowling. It was called Skittles back then. This is what I mean. Peasants to pass the time by to get away from work would create these unique games. And then the, comp the, then the nobles or the merchants would see them playing these games and put thought into it, right? And they would say, how can I monetize this game? How can I regulate this game? So now their bowling alley is everywhere and the peasants don't own them, but the peasants pay to use them. Go rent your shoes, right? Go buy your lane. Yo, that's crazy. As you can see, be, be, before, whenever we decide to do something for fun, we're not thinking about how to market it. We're just thinking about how to escape the, the harsh realities uh, of, working, of working all the time, working out in the sun and not having things. So we create these games for excitement, very good games. But what happens is the people that's outside of us, the people with money, the people with strategy, they are looking at what we're coming up with and literally monopolizing it and then won't allow us to do it. So if a peasant wanted to create a building, wanted to, wanted to build a building and have a bowling alley inside of it, then it, it's regulated to where they, they can't. It's like right now, if you want to have an NFL team, they're going to say, well, it's only 32 teams, right? But, but the peasants is who created the game of football. And now the nobles have regulated this game and now they won't let us play it on our own. It's, you're, you're breaking all these rules if you try to start your own league. Because they don't want you to. They, they're always trying to keep the peasants down. They're going to use what... They're watching you. They're watching you. See, it's the peasants that are, are working in the fields. It's the peasants that are creating tools to, to make the work in the field easier. But it's the noble who takes that tool and puts their stamp of, of creation on it. Because peasants don't think that way. So let's just say a, a, a peasant is in the field 
and they are tilling the field and they create a tool to make tilling the field easier. Well, the noble looks at that and says, I'm going to put a patent on that and say, I own it. Now I'm going to have more, more peasants make this tool for me and I'm going to sell the tool and I'm only going to give the peasants dollars and cents or cents on the hour to produce this tool for me. I didn't make the tool up. I, I didn't, that's not my, that's not mine. The person who made that tool, that's their, that's their, um, that's their key to getting out of being a peasant, but they don't know that. They're only looking to make their job a little easier. They're not trying to get out of it. You understand the mindset of a peasant and the mindset of a king or a noble or a merchant is totally different. And that's why I say if you don't have the mindset of a king, at least have the mindset of a merchant. The things that you create to make your job easy, to make your life easier, create those things with the, with the idea of putting them in other people's hands to make their job easier. Think like a merchant. Find ways to earn money using your own brilliant mind and your own brilliant gifts. If peasants thought like merchants, the nobles and stuff wouldn't be able to come in and, and regulate these sports to themselves. Do you understand, family? How many times you see an invention and you say, well, dang, a black person invented that. Yeah, you're likely talking about a slave. You're likely talking about someone who was an, an indentured servant who created that, that piece of uh, farm equipment. Because... Slave owners wouldn't have a reason to create that farm equipment. They don't work out there. They don't have the sweat on their brow. They're not trying. To, they, they don't need to try to figure out a way to make a better tool because they're not the ones out there breaking their back. It's the peasants out there that's breaking their back. Do you understand? Oh, no. See, I'm showing you guys what they did in the 1800s, uh, Diane, which, which made them a peasant. But I'm showing you guys how these things still exist. And we still spend our time doing these things, which would still make us peasants. So this is how the peasants spent their time in the 1800s. Now, look at that and translate that to, to the day. And look at how we spend our time today. Okay? We still spend our time just like a peasant. Now, we don't use the term peasant anymore. But we could be peasants based on how we spend our time. If it parallels with how peasants spent their time in the 1800s. So sometimes we have to take an eye and look across time so we can see who we truly are. Because... Coming into the world the way we come into the world, we're not called peasants. We're called citizens. So we don't have these type of, we don't have these type of words where a, we know a peasant is, is, a, is a word that is derogatory. That is a negative word. You know what I'm saying? We all pretending to be kings and stuff like that is back in the day, we'd say things like, get away from me, peasant. It means a person who has no, no power, no voting power, right? No control over their life. They're, they're a peasant. Life just happens to them. They have no control over life. Life happens to them. Right. It happens to them. You know, it, they, they don't control life. It happens to them. You're a peasant. You see. Let's continue, family. So, again, this game was 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 started by peasants where they're bowling this this uh, this wood or, a, or 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 some type of ball they made uh, into nine pins, which was later changed to ten pins. And converted to a game called bowling from the game called Skittles. But again, some noble or some merchant saw these uh, these countrymen, these peasants, playing these games in the streets, in the middle of the open streets, so everybody can see. Took that game from them, monopolized it, and sold it back to them. And they're richer than ever now because they watched what someone else was doing, took it, and used it to their advantage as a whole. Not they didn't use it for extracurricular activities; they used it for an investment. Does that make sense? Let's continue. Modern day golf is a strategic sport that many love. But what could be more fun than shooting 18 holes on some beautifully manicured links? Well, how about a relaxing game of golf, complete with broken church windows and injured pedestrians? See it happening Mainly again, played right? in the Netherlands during the Middle Ages, golf used a wooden club to hit a small ball to a predetermined target. The game was popular in towns and villages, where it was often played in the streets. This caused some problems. Wayward golf balls caused damage, hit unsuspecting passerbys, and broke plenty of windows. So it was probably a good thing the game eventually moved to play in open fields. In the 1500s, a mini ice age made it possible to play on frozen lakes and rivers. Who knew golf could be so much fun on skates? Since it was more challenging to hit the ball a certain distance on the ice, golf became a game of precision instead. 
So a game that was called golf, of course, now it's changed to golf, and on ice it's called hockey, was another game that was taken from the common folk or from the peasants, okay? The nobles or, or the merchants are watching you guys play games, and then they are regulating these games and using them to their own advantage by monopolizing the game, okay? Creating rules, making them into teams, um, uh, and separating it from the, the commoners, so to speak, putting it in arenas and things of that nature. You know what I mean? So... Again, next time you play golf or hockey, know that this was stolen from a peasant's idea. And some nobleman, some merchant took it and made it a million, billion dollar idea. And look at how it's grown today. And think about how much money is earned through something a peasant started. But a peasant is not only receiving end of getting rich off of it as a whole. They, they can only take part in playing the game like they've always done. They never get more than what they, they, they never get more. They, they don't get what they truly deserve. Who should truly reap the benefits of that game? Shouldn't it be the peasants? Thank you so much, Andrea. They created the game, but yet they don't reap no benefits of it because they're not regulating the game and, and making it to where it can be marketable. You see what I'm saying? And so peasants, they stop the thinking. They stop thinking with the game. They're just trying to think of a fun game. They're not thinking of how I can use this game to, to raise myself up to a different plateau or level. You understand? That there's a big problem when you're not thinking, when you're not seeing the whole picture. Many of y'all got ideas in, inside of y'all heads, but just like a peasant, you're not using that idea. You're not going to do the work to make that idea come to fruition. And when some a uh, fruition, and when someone um, creates this idea, you're going to say, "Oh, I thought of that years ago." Yeah, just like a peasant. When peasants finally saw football being played in arenas and ran with owners and things like that, you know what they said to themselves? That's our game. We started playing that years ago. Yeah, you did. You did, but they patented it. They patented the game. You see what I'm saying? They regulated the game. They monopolized the game. You played the game and got injured and killed in the process. And all of your blood, sweat, and tears got converted into their wealth. And they say what's the wealth of the wicked is, uh, is stored up for the righteous, but is that really true in, in today's life, family? Is it really true? It seems like the wealth of the, of the righteous is usurped by the wicked because the righteous ain't thinking about wealth. They're just thinking about enjoying life. That, and that's what, don't get me wrong, family. That's the natural thing to do is think about, is think about enjoying life because money is fake. So, so, the, so the peasant, they didn't come into a world where um, they think about money because money is fake. Naturally, you wouldn't think about it. You would think about, you know, having fun. You would think about uh, having camaraderie with your friends and family. You would think about that. But as the merchant thinks, the merchant's been taught and trained to think with money. So they're going to watch what you do and they're going to put how they think with it. You're not wrong for not thinking about money because money isn't real. You shouldn't think about it. But once you learn how to be a merchant, once you learn how to change your life, you have to change your psychosis. Right? This is why I say you have to change your paradigm, which is your habits, all that follows your outlook on life. If your outlook on life isn't things that are concerning money because you was raised by poor people, if you ever read the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad, it talks about that a lot, how a poor person, how a poor father raises his child versus how a rich father raises their child, how a, how a poor person spends their money versus how a rich person spends their money. A poor person and a rich person can have the same amount of income, but they'll spend it totally different. The rich person will make their money work for them, whereas a poor person will spend their money and, and dig holes for themselves and create areas for them to have to work harder to keep their head above water. Same income, but not understanding money and how to spend it. That's your detriment. Now, money is fake. Money is just something that we use for, use for social trade. So a natural being wouldn't naturally think about money as it is a matrix thing. But your paradigm is what has you where you are. So your lack of thinking about money has you in the conditions that you are because your habits follow seeking excitement. Your habits follow escaping the matrix. And anytime that you're doing that, you're not investing in your future. Does that make sense, family? What you need says I got so much older uh, just to be hearing this knowledge and I have been operating as a peasant my whole life. See, Admitting that is, um, I say admission is the key to unlocking the universe. Admit it. Say, man, I'm a peasant. I've been a peasant. But you know what? I'm not a peasant. I mean, habitually, by habit, by paradigm, I've been carrying myself like a peasant, but I'm not happy being a peasant. 
I've, I've never been comfortable in, in this condition. And so I know that I'm not a peasant internally. My ancestors aren't a peasant, but due to being raised around peasants, I think like one, therefore I behave like one. But it's time today for me to stop behaving like a peasant. It's time for me to start putting more thought into my actions and seeing them out. Why did I get this idea to create this game? Is it just to play the game or is it to take it further than that? You see, this is why a lot of wealthy people, they patent stuff before they ever tell people about it because they don't want their ideas to be stolen and patented. Right, Devin. Let's continue. While some medieval pastimes were all fun and games, some of them were straight up blood sport. Bull baiting and cockfights were widespread, but nothing compared to the medieval fascination with bear baiting. In this grisly sport, a bear was chained to a post to prevent it running off or mauling some random spectator. Then the bear was attacked by dogs. The dogs would either kill the bear or the bear would prevail and kill the dogs. It was not the sport of animal lovers and things got pretty weird from there. Dedicated bear baiting arenas existed along the Thames at Bankside. The sport became an entire industry with specialized breeding, licensing, and celebrity bears. Winning bears received the old Roman gladiator treatment and even had names like George Stone or Blind Bess. It was a profitable business with tremendous popularity. People came from far and wide to see bear baiting events. Everyone from the poorest classes to the wealthy elite and royalty enjoyed a good bear baiting event. The event was such a part of the culture, it even made its way into Shakespeare's The Merry Wives of Windsor. And it continued for a very long time. While bear baiting was outlawed in Great Britain by 1835, it persisted in other parts of the world until quite recently. Peace, my beautiful sister. Good to see you, sweetheart. So look, family. So bear baiting, okay? So now, as you can see, they were taken animals and at their expense having them fight and kill each other for their own excitement and as you can see the nobles the merchants took that industrialized that just like they did everything else and now there's these huge gladiator gladiator arenas when you come to see animals fight and rip each other apart and your time could be spent somewhere else investing in your future self pouring your your knowledge into your children but instead you're somewhere watching dogs tear apart Bears or bears tear apart dogs. Thank you so much, so much, Marsha. And you know you had the cop fighting pits, the dog fighting pits. You had all these things where you where you would. Uh, thank you so much, Toya. Thank you so much, sis. Um. So um, so you, again, watching watching these animals rip themselves apart is entertaining to us. You understand? And we could have been spending that time somewhere becoming better, but instead we are watching these animals rip themselves apart. You understand, family? And look, look, special licenses. Special breeding, all of that went into breeding bigger, bigger, stronger dogs to try and rip apart these bears. You see what I'm saying, family? Thank you so much, Tish. And this is how peasants are spending their time making people who are literally using animals for at their own expense to create some type of entertainment or excitement. And the peasants are making those people richer. Thank you so much, Kelvin. A person says, I'm going to industrialize this game where we let a bunch of animals rip each other apart. We're going to put a bunch of dogs in, in this arena and let them try to fight and kill bears. And the peasants literally made him rich for that. Right? Literally made him rich. That idea made that man rich because peasants need entertainment that bad. And this is why I keep saying to you guys, maybe life is not all about fun and being entertained. Maybe it's about Pouring your life and legacy into your endeavors. You know what I'm saying? Pour, pouring your, your, your focus into your endeavors and thinking about your legacy. You know what I'm saying? Like we're sacrificing our legacy for fun. Thank you so much, April Lee. Sacrificing our whole legacy for fun, family. Let's continue. Sometimes being a member of the lower classes meant you weren't allowed to participate in certain activities. This included that famous knight sport, jousting. In an attempt to mock the knights and enjoy a little bit of jousting for themselves, the peasants took to water jousting. A glorious parody of the famous knight sport, water jousting, used boats instead of horses. 
Mm-hmm. Jousting on boats. That sounds pretty cool. The sport became massively popular all over Europe. If you wanted to play some water jousting, all you needed was a river, a boat, a pole, and a couple of like-minded buddies. Most of the team's participants manned the oars, while one designated individual performed the actual jousting. It was much safer than the land version. Actual jousting typically resulted in broken bones or even death. In water jousting, however, the worst case scenario might be getting knocked into the water and emerging soaking wet or drowning. So I guess there's still a pretty big downside. So as you can see, another form of entertainment becoming industrialized, okay, and used for entertainment for the peasants, but the nobles um, monetized it or, or monopolized it. And again, what, what, what that should be showing you guys is it's not that we don't have value. It's not that the peasants don't have value within them. And what I keep saying is a king learns what value they have within themselves and tries to, tries to discover how can I offer that value to the world? Create a way to cultivate that value, market it, and allow that to be how he uh, makes his money, okay? How he furthers his kingdom. Thank you so much for again, because that's the gift that's inside of you. Well, these, as you can see, the peasants have gifts that's inside of them, and they're using their gifts um, to, to enjoy themselves, to create uh, sports, to create games. But on the flip side of that, someone's taking advantage of that. They're taking that value that they are, that they are creating and usurping that value. They're allowing the peasants to participate in a the thing they created, but not own it. But the peasant could own it. There's no laws against that. They just think like a peasant. They didn't take the time to regulate it. They could have done that. They could have worked hard to come up with money. They could have, these, all these people that joined together to play these games, they could have did a collection with all those people to regulate that game. You understand But a lot of times peasants don't work together when it comes to building each other. They'll definitely play a game together. They'll injure each other in hopes of having fun, and they'll do that in droves. But if you talk to them and say, hey, y'all, let's rally our funds like the rich do. The rich people will use us to raise money for their endeavors. Well, let's, let us use us to raise money for our endeavors. Oh, I don't trust you. You're a peasant like me. And that's what genuinely happens in, in, uh, generally happens in, in our communities. When, when another peasant tries to raise up and, and see uh, that the monies that the community is spending could be used on something better, so they try to lobby that to the community and says, hey, let's all put our funds together to create this. They get criticized for doing so, called a scammer, get told they're using people. But when the rich does this, they create it in the form of a lottery. You'll never know that they're collecting funds to further an agenda because they don't tell you that. And so you're not going to think about what are you going to do with this money? You're just going to think about, oh, oh, lottery tickets, raffle, chance to win. And this is, you literally can be giving more money to win the lottery ticket. You know, you, you'll buy a $20 scratch off. No problem. You're not going to care about where the money money went. But if you send me $10, two years later, you'll be asking me where the money went. Because you donated it. You see what I'm saying? In your mind, I donated the money for a cause. But in the lottery, I bought the ticket and you don't know it was for a cause. And that's why it's, it's, it's difficult for peasants to, to create things where you, where you use money, uh, where you raise money amongst the people. Because there's going to be people who are going to make up things about you. You know, tell you that you didn't spend it right, ask you where the money went before you even have time to raise enough to get it going. And you'll likely be criminalized before you even have a chance to create what you're creating. You see what I'm saying? So many people will hate on you because the, the people believed in you and donated to you. They, they're already mad because it wasn't them that donated to. And so peasants generally, generally work to keep each other down. But when it becomes a noble, they'll give a noble or a merchant respect that they ain't even worthy of. But that noble or merchant is literally there to steal their ideas. Usurp their ideas. So, they, so they, it's like they make enemies out of their very own peers, but trust the, the very people who are stealing from them. You see what I'm saying? It's crazy. Let's continue. Ice skating and skiing are always fun in the wintertime, but back in medieval times, things got a little crazy. These activities didn't start out as a way to have fun. They were born out of practicality. Places like Finland were icy for most of the year, and ice skating or skiing offered a means to get from place to place quickly. Skidding across large bodies of frozen water was useful for transporting goods during the winter time. But at some point, folks realized skating could be a fun activity, too. Ice skating eventually reached England, where skaters often crashed into one another. 
And a head first fall onto the ice could spell certain doom. Thank you, Tasha. Broken limbs weren't uncommon either. It probably didn't help that ice skates were completely different from those we have today. Well, you can go down to the ice skating rink and rent out a nice pair of metal skates today. Those luxuries didn't exist in the distant past. Instead, ice skates were fashioned from carved bones that were attached to shoes with leather cords. They worked pretty well, since animal bones have their own natural oils and wax that enables decent ice skating ability. But they definitely weren't safe. Medieval peasants, however, wouldn't just leave it at that. They just had to find a way to turn ice skating into some kind of jousting match. And that's precisely what they did. Some ice skaters used poles to push themselves around the ice. Someone got the bright idea to repurpose those poles as jousting equipment. And ice jousting was born. Ice jousting is exactly what it sounds like, having a jousting match on the ice. Kind of a flimsy excuse to break a few bones, but in the absence of hockey matches and football games, it was probably a great substitute sport. So what do you think? What medieval pastime sounds fun to you? Let us know in the comments below and why... Again... You know, uh, mo moving about the ice was something that wasn't about sports. It was about traveling. And who was your traveler's family? Your peasants. So they would have to travel on this ice, like they said, and especially in icy areas like Finland. They would have to travel. And before you know it, <clears throat> they were using these same uh, traveling tools as another way to play games. And then what happened again? It got usurped and used to make the wealthy money, the nobles money, the merchants money. Do you understand? And I want you guys to understand what happens is you have your king and then you have your uh, lords. And what happens is that king, he, he owns a certain amount of land. OK, now what that king will do is he's going to put castles throughout that land to occupy um, the, the entirety of the land. Now, who he puts in those castles are who you're going to call your lords. OK, your lords. And so that so that king is going to say, hey, Lord, you go to this castle, you run this castle that that Lord gets to have people work for him, his nobles, his merchants and things of that nature. OK, now peasants are just the people who are in the city, who people who get to live on the land in which what the king inhabits. So if obviously people already live on the land, what the king does is he defeats the other king and then declares he owns all the land because he has the resources and he won in the, in the war, but he don't really own the land. It's just earth, right? But this is what they're saying. Now, to the people who live on this land, this is when they go to the people and say, hey, you now have a new king. This is what taxes are going to be. This is me charging you to live on the very land that you already live on. I don't own your land, and I'm not selling you the land. I'm just going to charge you for living on the land. This creates a, a, a passive income for me that I always have. You'll always pay me, and you'll never, you'll, you'll, you will never own the land. So it's called taxes. OK, can, can we do rent to own? Don't worry about rent to own. I'm going to charge you taxes. You never going to own. And you're not even renting because I can still make you leave, even though you're paying taxes. You don't own it at all. You understand? Not only are you are you giving me are you giving me taxes to live on this land? You're going to give me taxes to be able to use this land to survive off of it. So if you grow, if you grow a garden, if you grow herbs, if you if you bring in animals to the land, then I want a portion of everything that you're earning. You see, isn't that what the government tells you? If you go get a job today, they're going to tell you, I'm taxing you on your earnings. This is you paying the government for an opportunity to work. And you say, well, I'm a free man. Well, you can't even work without permission. You have to pay the government to work. You have to give them a, a, a percentage of your funds just to work. That is taxes, family. You understand and so that's what the peasant does. He works, and with his work, he pays taxes to the kings, to the lords. You understand? That's what the merchants do. They pay a tax to the lords, to the kings, to be able to be a merchant. You understand? But merchants have more social power than a commoner. In fact, the commoner or the peasant was literally at the bottom. You got the same amount of rights typically as a homeless person. Okay, you might have a home, you might have a farm, but you don't really own it. You're just working it. It's You're borrowing it, so to speak, according to the kingdoms. You understand? That can be taken from you and given to somebody else just because they like them. You know what I'm saying? So it's not yours. You can't leave that to your children. And that's what we have now. We have jobs that we work. We believe in these jobs. These jobs help us to live. You know, they offer us um, so sometimes great things, a vacation. They offer us benefits and things of that nature. But truthfully, we can't pass that job down to our child because we don't own the company. 
You understand? So we are wasting our life away tilling the land that you're never going to own. Your family's never going to own. Likewise, you're wasting your life away by get using your best years, your best gifts and skill sets and ideas to further along a company that's not going to give you anything um, in terms to take with you, anything for ownership, anything to pass on to your children. And they're going to forever use your ideas, family. You understand? So they use your ideas as a sort of like a passive income. You come up with an idea to make the job uh, easier, to make, make, the, uh, make the job run easier, create tools and things of that nature. They're going to forever be in a better position because of what you created as an employee while you work for them. But you, on the other hand, the day you leave that job, that's when it cuts off for you. So you got to start thinking like a merchant first. Start thinking like a nobleman next. You understand? Because in, in the social structure, you had the peasants. Then you had your merchants and nobles or whatever. And the soldiers were, 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 were a little bit higher than the merchants and nobles. You understand? But then you had your lords who was over them. And then you had your kings who was over the lords. You know what I mean? If you translate that to our society, you have citizens. They are at the very bottom. While they appear to have rights, they really don't. You understand? If you came up with the invention right now, what would you do? Likely you don't know. You understand? Likely you do not know. And think about a lot of things that you would like to start, but you can't because there's some type of regulation or certification that's attached to being able to get it. So you have to pay your dues to the government just to be able to perform in something that you created, that you came up with, that you want to do. You understand? When again, a merchant is someone who has more control over their life than a, um, a peasant because the merchant has a product that they're selling. They have a skill that they've cultivated that they're going to use to help their life out. So they're going to, maybe they weld, maybe they are an, um, a carpenter, right? And so they use that skill set to create a way of life for themselves. That's what a merchant is. So they either have a skill set that they have cultivated and they sell that skill set as a service or they buy and sell products by marking them up, okay? Making them a merchant means they can take their show on the road. They have a little bit more power, a little bit more freedom than that of a peasant. Peasants can't go nowhere because they got to be at work in the morning. Somebody else telling them exactly where to be, how long to be. In fact, the hour before the peasant goes home, the boss man can walk up to him, the nobleman can walk up to him, the merchant can walk up to him and say, you, you got to work over because we didn't get as much done as we wanted to. And the peasant's like, ah, crap, I wanted to go home. Well, you can't go home, you peasant. You can't even go home. You're going to stay here because I said so because my company needs to produce more products. And that's at your expense. He going home, though. He's going to go home. You know what I'm saying? So you're, you're not going home. And you just got told. So now you're telling your family, hey, I was going to come home, but, you know, I got to stay over. You know, they, they came through. They, you know, they need some more, more work. We were moving slow. So and then what happens is they're going to work the crap out of you. And then whenever they get so much products built up because they worked you to build them, all of a sudden, a new season comes, and there's not as many orders, and now they have more products than they need, and guess who's going to pay for that? You are, because they're going to lay you off until they need you again, and they're not going to pay you while you're laid off. So they worked you overtime to be able to get the products that they have. Now that they have them, they laid your ass off, and you don't get no, no, no work, no, no pay for work, because you're not working, and that, that's the deal. They got all the extra work out of you by working you over, telling you, I'll give you a little bit more in an hour or whatever. And then you did it, and now all of a sudden, you're being laid off because the company's moving a little bit slower. Is there some type of money that come with that? No. Put, take your ass to the unemployment office. And that's things that we have now, but we didn't even have that then. And this is why I say, are you going to live your life forever in the, in, under, the, the, under the demands of another, or are you going to slowly but surely take back your life by using your skills for you, not using your skills for them? Now, many of us right now, we have jobs. OK, we go to work every day. That's fine. You use your skill for someone else right now. That's fine. As a king, as a queen, as a noble, as a merchant. Now you're going to decide how am I going to be a king, queen, noble or merchant? How do I change my paradigm, change my habits so I can stop being a peasant? Does that make sense? Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you so much for being a subscriber. How do I stop being a peasant? I have to change my habits. Right. So right now I'm a peasant through and through. I'm giving, I'm giving my time and energy to a work, to a, to a job, and I'm not giving myself any energy outside of that job. Well, I got to change that. I have to start giving myself and investing some of my energy and time into sharpening myself so I can get myself out of the peasant mentality, 
out of the peasant title so I can grow socially in this world because I truly do want more for my family and I don't want my children to be a peasant. I don't want my children to have to work and then find ways to, 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 uh, to separate themselves from work by doing fun things and not things that actually build your inheritance, create your, create your lineage and tribe. Thank you so much, Anthony Tony. Does this make sense? So from this day forward, family, this is just the beginning now. We're going to build on this every single day, okay? Now, we talked about today what is being the king. I mean, what is being a peasant? Tomorrow, family, we're going to build on this idea. How do I transform? How do I transform from being a peasant to a king? We're going to call the next uh, live from rags to riches, from rags to righteous, from rags to having a righteous vision for your life. You are in rags. But now the place that you see yourself is righteous, okay? I, I'm, I'm thinking about my family now. Thank you so much, Jeremiah. I'm not just trying to pass the time by, okay? I'm trying to think about how I can uh, cultivate my, my genealogy, how I can build my next best self, how I can build my, my, my current self, who I'm going to marry, and that's going to be based on her character, her femininity, her ability to nurture, um, her health, overall health. I'm going to make sure I choose the right queen to have a child with. I'm, not, I'm no longer going to just keep having sex for fun because that's what peasants do too. You understand? Peasants throw themselves into the brothels to get themselves away from, you know, the, uh, the harsh realities that they face. And again, if you out here having children with a whole bunch of low vibrational people, that's not going to be something that's conducive to building your lineage. So you're going to have to decide who you're going to be today. You understand, family? Are you going to be a person with low values? Or are you going to be a person who raises your standards to equal that of where you want to be in life? You understand? I, my, my hope is that every one of you guys rise through meditation and through thought um, by applying energy and effort into the things we talk about. Let them run them through your mind's eye daily, family. Uh, think, get your, get your motor going so you can figure out a way to, to dig yourself out of the position that you are in. Dig yourself out of the psychosis that you are in. Change your paradigm by changing your habits and changing your outlook on life. Today, you got to learn that you have many uh, similarities with a peasant. Am I saying that you should walk away feeling like a peasant? Well, for me, when I heard this information, it enlightened me that I have a lot of peasant ways and it, it gave me the opportunity to make changes. So I see it as a benefit. So I can accept that I'm a peasant and see it as a benefit, the fact that I have opportunities now to not be a peasant. I'm enlightened now to know what a peasant is and what a peasant does. And I can't just, I can't say I'm not a peasant based on how I carry myself. I've had ideas stolen right from me. I've had ideas where, um, where I have, uh, you know, just let them linger in my mind and just let them sit. And then somebody else comes out with that idea and I'm like, dang, I thought of that. Well, that was my idea. But like a peasant, I didn't, I didn't try to do anything with it. And, I, and someone who thought like a merchant did something with that idea and I didn't, I can't be mad. You understand? Someone says, I like sex, and, but I can't have children anymore. Listen, we all like sex. Your body is engineered to like sex. Uh, I once heard a scientist say that sex shouldn't even feel good according to everything that's happening in your body when you do it. But it does bring pleasure. And that pleasure alone is what keeps us having children. So, of course, sex feels good. But sex is a sacred thing. And we should all have discipline. Whenever we do those things, because a lack of discipline is what makes us bad. That don't mean that the necessary act is bad. It's the lack of discipline that makes it bad for us. So while sex is healthy, while sex creates life, um, misuse of sex can, can throw you in a, in a very bad place. You, it can throw you in a very bad place, you know, either socially by how people look at you, disease, or even um, uh, ruining your life in terms of how the people you bring into your life. Or, and of course, having children out of wedlock a lot with people that you shouldn't be having children with, um, people with low character. So again, sex is something that it feels good, but you should take the time um, uh, to put into uh, who you're having sex with and the thought behind why you're having sex. Because it could be something that you just do. I mean, you could just do it. You don't have to vet people. You don't have to have standards, but you, you, the karma is going to come back for you not having standards around those things. So that's why I say... Peasants, uh, with men who are peasants, we're taught that sex makes us better. Sex makes us uh, more capable. Sex validates us. But again, that creates men who go around trying to have sex to, to uh, prove something. And again, you're not putting your kingdom forward. You're putting your ego forward. 
And what that's going to result in is destroying your kingdom because you're going to have a whole bunch of heirs out here that you can't be accountable to because you have more heirs than you have income. You have more children than you have money. And that's going to be difficult for you to maintain those children and take care of them and give them everything they need. Now you're a bad father because you brought children into this world who you cannot take care of. Now they, now they have problems with you. They have resentment towards you. Is that really the life you wanted to live? No, but living in survival mode, you are only thinking about the moment. And that's how you ended up with that life. You was thinking about ending your desire, ending your horniness, having sex at the moment. But you weren't thinking about, man, this action is going to have me bring a child into this world that I'm not going to be able to take care of. And this specific woman is going to weaponize this baby against me. You didn't try to do that, but you were living your life in survival and you weren't vetting. You weren't thinking through your actions. Do you understand family? And that's how peasants behave. They don't think about the future. While the king is thinking lineages ahead, the king sees way into the future. Well, the peasant don't th even think about tomorrow. They're only literally thinking about now. And that's what makes them a peasant. Your vision. So family, the next for tomorrow, we're going to talk about how to transform from a peasant to a king. Rags to righteous. What it means to truly have vision. And the vision alone should change your paradigm. Once you can see a little bit further into the future, because you say hindsight is 2020. If hindsight is 2020, then what is foresight? What is foresight? Think about this, family. If I were to begin to put thought into why I'm moving, wouldn't that create a better version of me rather than just moving based on my desires and letting my emotions carry me? What if I start putting intellect and logic into my moves, family? Right? If hindsight is 2020, then what is foresight? What is thinking ahead going to do for me? I guarantee you, family, that's going to be a great benefit. Because while, while hindsight is 2020, it does nothing for your past. You can only do something with your future. Hindsight is 2020, but it don't change the mistakes. So it's better to have foresight. You're still going to always have hindsight. Hindsight is something that everybody has. But foresight is something that few of us have. Cultivate your, few, your, your foresight. Start putting time into what's going to happen when you make this decision. Where is this going to lead me? Start thinking with the future in mind, family. Because you plan on being here for it. So start thinking with the future in mind. Unless you don't plan here being here after the day, then you don't have to take any thought for the future. But if you plan on being here tomorrow, think about tomorrow, family. Think about what you're doing today, how that's going to affect your tomorrow, family. Okay? Vision. Vision, not sight, but vision. Vision will ultimately change your paradigm, transforming you from rags to righteous or peasant to the king. But we'll talk about that tomorrow, family. Okay? Peace be unto all of you guys. Thank you guys so much for joining the live. Continue to share this live. For all of you newcomers who didn't get to watch this live, when you see this video, please share this content. Make this go viral, family, so as many people as possible can be in tune with these videos and make our lives better. Do you understand? In order for our lives to be better, we have to be accountable to making those lives better. Let's stop being lazy. Let's start being adults. Let's start taking, taking control of our lives, family, and decide who you want to be. A merchant, a noble, a, um, a uh, lord or a king. Decide what you're going to be, family. I see myself as a king. I see myself creating my very lineage, creating my very laws. Okay? The laws in which I'm, how I'm going to live my own life and how others will live their lives that's in my life. I've, I've taken all of that in, into consideration. And with vision, I've seen 100 years down the road on what my family looks like and what I want it to look like. And I've decided to take, take today and start working on what my family will look like 100 years from now. I call it vision because I know I won't be here 100 years from now. I know I won't be here 1,000 years from now, family. But I don't need sight. I need vision. I need to be able to see outside of my life. And because I can see that, I'm going to start today working on it. So my, my, my future ancestors or my future children and grandchildren and great-great-grands, they will know that their grandfather began working on their life years before they were ever born because he had the vision and the foresight to see them and where they would be and change his current situation so he could make sure that they end up in a better place. That means he loves them. I love children I ain't even had yet. I love grandchildren that I ain't even had yet because I'm taking the time right now out of my own life to create a better life for them by changing my ass, by changing me. Because I keep telling y'all, if you change you, you change the entire world. That don't just mean the world that's around you. That means the world is in the foreseeable future. That means before. That means even when you're not here no more, what you do today can change the world still. 
even in a world that you don't even exist anymore. Know your power as a true king. Stop being a peasant and know your power as a true king. See a thousand years into the future. See your family a thousand years from now and do whatever it takes today to make sure your family has that a thousand years from now. You will be the greatest ancestor that your family know of and all of your descendants or ascendants will be praising you and talking about you. I asked you guys last time, what's the difference in between you, Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, uh, my, my, uh, Nat Turner? What's, what's the difference in between you and all of these great, great kings and queens? Nothing. There's no difference. You have the ability to tap into your ancestral, ancestral realm just like they did. They're not different than you. They're not better than you. You can change the world just like they did. It could be you that's being talked about based on what you sacrificed, family. You can be one of them. Start seeing yourself as that type of greatness. We see the, the, we see the artists, the, uh, we see the singers, we see the, the, the famous people in our world. We keep wanting to be them people. But meanwhile, we praise people like Marcus Garvey. Then why don't you be Marcus Garvey? Is that too hard for you? Is that too difficult for you to be accountable to? Being that type of person is difficult, right? Because it's not show offy. You, Martin Luther King wasn't, wasn't, count, wasn't throwing up money. Malcolm X wasn't throwing up money and slapping women on their ass and bragging about how many women they had sex with. So you realize if, I, if I'm going to be that type of person, then I'm going to have to be a square in my communities. I'm going to have to be a lame in my communities. I'm going to have to be considered, you know, weak in my communities. It's not, it's not, that's, not the cool per, that's not the cool life. But you do have the ability to do that. It's just know that what they put around you is the matrix. They put people in front of you like singers and, and dancers and movie stars. So you can want to be them instead of being the people who create change in our reality. But decide who you're going to be. Family. Okay? You have the ability to be any one of those people. Don't let nobody in this entire world tell you different. Your greatest hero, you can be them. In fact, that's why they're your greatest hero. They're trying to show you, hey, I'm you in the future. Come on, become me and carry on the realm. Carry on the, the baton of what I left. That's why I vibrate. That's why I stand out to you. That's why you look up to me so much because you're supposed to be me. You're supposed to chase who I am, not just honor me and, and put, put a picture of me on your wall and just talk about my greatness and talk about me during Black History Month. You are supposed to be the next me. If you love Martin Luther King, you love Malcolm X, then you're supposed to be them. But instead, you'd rather be Denzel Washington. I ain't nothing wrong with that. But your hero is not Denzel Washington. Do you understand? It's time for y'all to be great and stop letting your imagination limit you. Who do you want to be, family? Decide and do the work to do that, family. Okay? Be evolution. Be the change that you want to see. No candle loses its flame from lighting the other. And if you were to ever find yourself in the middle of chaos, it's in that chaos that you have found yourself, family. Okay? And, my, and the other quote I added to this is, you will never cross the ocean until you have the courage to leave the shore. I'm hoping that all of you have the courage to stop being a peasant. I'm hoping that all of you have, a, have the courage to vibrate to that of a noble, a lord, a merchant, or a king. I'm hoping that we stop um, chasing um, escapes from our reality, but we start creating things to actually get us out of our reality, not just short escapes, short breaks from our reality, but we create things to where we never have to go back to that. Do you understand? Rise, family. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Subscribe today, family. Make sure you guys are subscribing today because this will be 9 o'clock uh, a.m. Eastern tomorrow for subscribers only. Okay, so chat amongst with the, with the subscribers currently. If you do not know how to do it, send them a message and ask them, how do I subscribe? You'll see a green badge like Devin Estrada. I, I pinned his um, comment. As you can see, that green badge is right there. That means he is a... He's a subscriber, so you can simply message people like him, okay? Message people like Miss Rose. Message people that you see on here that are subscribers, family, and ask them, how did you subscribe? Where is the tab? And see if they can't help you through that, okay? I'll see you guys uh, tomorrow, family. Peace to you. I love you all.